Welcome everybody to the Legends of March Madness on the Gruley Truth Sports Network. I'm your host for the Legends of March Madness, Mike Goodpaster, and today we're going to talk about the last perfect season in NCAA basketball history, the 1976 Indiana Hoosiers. Now, others have threatened in succeeding years, but this team, coached by Bob Knight, still stands today as the last to navigate an entire season without losing even a single game. Today we're going to talk about the memories of that 1976 season, which I believe I was eight years old. It's the first season I remember of college basketball, and I'll never forget what I saw. And it was the closest thing to perfection that college basketball has ever seen. Now, Indiana the year before the 1975 season had been undefeated also going into the NCAA tournament. They ended the season 31-1. and 31 and 1. And they didn't lose until the regional final when they lost to Kentucky. Now, many believed that had star forward Scott May not broken his wrist against Purdue less than a month before the NCAA tournament began, the Hoosiers might have finished that season undefeated as well. Instead, UCLA and John Wooden won the 1975 National Championship, sending the legendary Bruins coach into retirement with one final title. Indiana graduated five seniors as they prepared for the 1976 season. Now, everybody kind of felt incomplete from the 1975 season. And I think after 1975, the goal for Knight wasn't what it usually was, which was the Winnipeg 10 championship. Um, I think that Knight raised the sights to say that winning a championship in itself would not be enough. He said, if you guys play to your potential, you won't lose a game. Anything short of that is a disappointment. Now, that, of course, is me paraphrasing, but that was obviously the feeling. Now, in particular, Indiana had lost its leading scorer, Steve Green, and fifth, year, or fifth leading scorer, John Laskowski, from the 1975 team. Now, the Hoosiers also that year had averaged 88 points per game. Remember, no three-point line, no shot clock. And that 88 points was 22.1 points more than their opponents in 1974 and 75. But the offense on this team had taken a hit. Now, the personnel they had coming back was great. But I don't think that anybody realized until the actual, actually when the season started how much that offense had really lost. Now, when we get to the start of the season... The thing that really stood out to me, first IU game I remember, and it, it was sometime during the 74-75 season, Knight approached May and Buckner with a question. Indiana was offered a chance to schedule UCLA to start the next season. Would they want that game? Both, of course, said yes. It would be a nationally televised matchup played in St. Louis and scheduled to start after 10 p.m., so it could be available to other time zones. Now, in those days, anything that was a national telecast had this unbelievable aura about it because networks then didn't really give the attention to college basketball that it does to now. Now, the nationally televised game was not really a part of the lexicon then. The UCLA game was a phenomenon. Now, before the Hoosiers battled UCLA, Indiana had beaten the Soviet national team at one world championship before that in a preseason game in front of 19,000 on November 29th at Market Square Arena. Behind Scott May's 33 points, the Indiana Hoosiers decimated the Russians. Now, when we get to St. Louis for this nationally televised game, I think UCLA thought they were going to win another national championship. But when Indiana got to St. Louis... Indiana destroyed them. They flat out outplayed them in every aspect. And the first game against UCLA was important because it really stated that this team was legitimate. Now, the first big matchup in a regular season, they did have a close win against Notre Dame at 63-60, to but the first really big matchup was against Joe B. Hall's Kentucky Wildcats. Now, remember, Kentucky had ended IU's undefeated season in the regional finals the year before, but this was nowhere near the same team that had finished national runner-up to UCLA in 75. Hall's 1976 team would go on to win 20 games and win the NIT over North Carolina Charlotte. But the Wildcats, even though just 3-0, and gave Indiana trouble from the beginning. 
on that December 15th game. Now, this game was played in Freedom Hall in Louisville. And the thing that stands out here was the Wildcats came out and went zone and really gave Indiana issues. Buckner struggled with fouls. Goose Gibbons scored 20 points for Kentucky. And if not for a missed goaltending call in the final seconds, IU might have lost its shot at being undefeated in the fourth game of the season. Instead, Benson's flying or game tying tip in with six seconds left sent the game into overtime where IU blew out Kentucky 13 to 4. In all honesty, Indiana was really lucky that they won the game. Um, you know, you had the last second tip in that sent it to the overtime, but there was really a, the goaltending call should have went against Indiana, which would have ended the game there. But when you go undefeated, you got to have a little luck too. And it wouldn't be the last time that Indiana would have a little bit of luck on their side. Now, Indiana got a handful of close calls in its next 14 games, including a seven-point win against a really good St. John's team in front of a sold-out Madison Square Garden. They had a two-point escape from Columbus in the Hoosiers' Big Ten opener against Ohio State. But Johnny Orr's Michigan Wolverines would provide IU its toughest test of the conference season and perhaps the season overall on February the 7th in Bloomington. Indiana struggled offensively. The Wolverines took early command of the game and led much of the way. Then Benson came through again. Michigan's Steve Grote had two free throws missed, or had two free throws. He misses both of them. Indiana breaks it down with about five seconds to go. Buckner, within the offense, puts up a shot from the top of the key. It was going to go out of bounds. About two-thirds of the way to the end line, Jimmy Cruz dove in and threw it towards the direction of the basket. It was more of a save than a shot, just a desperation type thing. But Cruz batted it back towards the rim, and Kim Benson laid it in. The referees all got together, discussed whether the ball was tipped in in time, and all that kind of crap, and the basket ended up counting. And just like the Kentucky game, Indiana beat the snot out of Michigan in the overtime, ended up winning the game 72-65. to Now, the forgotten guy in that Michigan game was Wayne Radford. He came off the bench, had 16 points, which was his season high, and he was the only guy in the ball club that could hit the basket. Abernathy, Buckner, Wilkerson, all together were 2 for 22. May was 11 for 30. Benson had a pretty decent game, 21 points, 15 rebounds. Rafford, though, was 6 for 7 with 16 points. And really, when people look back, they talk about Jimmy Cruz saving it, Kemp Benson saving it. But without Wayne Radford, they're not even in position to be able to win this game. Now, Indiana's back in the tournament. First time since 19, or since the last time is 75. But this time, they are considered a number one seed. The last time Indiana had won a national championship was 1953 when they beat Kansas behind Branch McCracken. So this is over 20 years ago. And when Knight first arrived in Bloomington, the only viable way to the NCAA tournament was by winning your conference. But the tournament had recently expanded to 32 teams, which made room for Indiana and Michigan. Now, the Hoosiers got a rough road. They started with the rematch against the ranked St. John's. I think they were ranked like 17th in South Bend in the first round. From there, they went to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where they would face two top 10 teams. Alabama, who was ranked 7th, and Marquette, who, believe it or not, was ranked number 2. This is, I think, where you get the rankings in the seeds at the tournament because I don't think the NCAA ever wanted their number one and two teams to do battle before the Final Four ever again. Now, Marquette and Alabama were two really good teams, and those were tough games. They were tight games. Alabama big man Leon Douglas gave the Hoosiers trouble inside, but Indiana held off the SEC champions for a five-point win. Al McGuire and second-ranked Marquette were waiting in the regional final where IU season had ended in 1975. As always, McGuire had those guys playing loose, but the Hoosiers started to pull away with about 10 minutes to go, maybe 7 minutes, somewhere in between there, and opened up a 10-12 to 12 point lead. And it was then that Al McGuire gets basically pissed off. He reacted to something, kicked the soccer or the scorer's table, and they gave him a technical. It was like the floodgates just opened from that point on, 
the game was Indiana's. Indiana beat, ended up beating Marquette 65-56 to to clinch a berth in the national semifinal. And like I said, that game, their tournament route, was essentially why the NCAA went to seeding because number one and number two played each other before the Final Four. And the NCAA, as I said, decided they didn't want to do that again. Now, the Final Four in Philadelphia. Familiar faces were there to greet the Hoosiers. Indiana would have to go through UCLA to reach the final. And, of course, you know, Coach Orr's feisty Michigan team, the one that had almost ended the push for perfection in February. Now, the presumption was that UCLA would make the most of its second crack at the Hoosiers in exact revenge with a spot in the national title game on the line. Instead, the Bruins, who were 27-3 and that year, coached by Gene Bartow in his first year after replacing the great John Wooden, the Bruins fell, this time by 14, setting up a third game between the Hoosiers and the Wolverines. Now, this is where it gets a little hairy if you're an Indiana fan, and I remember this. I remember sitting in my living room in a U-shaped house with some orange carpet around me. Shag! And remember, it's 1976. Early on, Bobby Wilkerson goes down with an injury. He gets hit in the head. He had a concussion and was taken to the hospital. And I think this was the only time where there was any doubt that Indiana would win this game. And then Michigan goes on to play a great first half. And I think Indiana people, not the team, but I think the people were really stunned when Wilkerson went out because it really brings up the realization of the similarity to what happened with the Scott May situation the year before. Here they are, the championship game, and they lose one of their vital players. The parallel between May's injury and Wilkerson's was obvious. The results, though, proved very different. Now, still, Michigan led the game 35-29 to at halftime after a late surge at the end of the first half. The best story you'll hear about this from watching Showtime's Perfect Show or I saw a Scott May interview to Sports Illustrated in 1995, was Coach Knight didn't write anything on the board at halftime. And for a while, he didn't say a word. Then he said, if you guys want to be champions, if you want to make history and do something that maybe no other team will ever do, you've got 20 minutes to prove it. And that was it. And I heard later on from a couple guys that played on the 76 team that they were pretty sure he'd waited two years to be in position to say that. Now, Indiana played maybe the greatest half in NCAA championship history. They outscored the Wolverines 57-33. to That 57 points is still the NCAA championship record for a half. And that wasn't a great offensive team like the 75 team. But they played that half as bad as well as you could possibly play it. The execution of that team was unbelievable. The only teams I I would compare it to would be the John Wooden teams of Lou Alcindor, Bill Walton, where they do everything perfect pretty much all the time. Now, the thing I really remember about that game was the last two to three minutes of the ball game. When everybody knew the game was in hand and Coach Knight started taking players out of the game one at a time, Every time there was a free throw, he'd pull somebody out. The Hoosier crowd went nuts. And that was the first time, really, I saw these guys celebrate that they'd something special. You know, they never made fools of themselves in any way, but there was true emotion. There were tears. It was a special moment. And this was from a team that basically just went out, won their games, and went home before this. Now, the interesting thing that I found out later was Coach Knight elected not to fly home with his team. Instead, he went to a high school all-star game to scout. The Hoosiers flew into Indianapolis before busing down to Bloomington for a celebration with the fans at Assembly Hall. The airport was wall-to-wall people. The best story I heard about this was at State Road 67 down to Martinsville, 39 across to 37 down to Bloomington. The roads were lined with people. And it's almost like if you take it back to the Milan Indians of 1954. I got the pleasure to interview Bobby Plump a few weeks ago. And to hear him talk about how the highway was lined with people all the way from Indianapolis to Milan, this was the same way. This was the pride of Indiana. It was this crazy celebration in Assembly Hall. 
probably the most famous line I can remember from sitting up there, Coach Knight saying, take a look at this group one last time because you'll never see a group like this again. And he was right. We've never seen a group like this again. And to me, it's apropos because basketball is Indiana. Indiana is basketball. And if you look at the history of Indiana basketball, from the Franklin Wonder Five um, to Wingate High School to the Milan Indies to Christmas Addicts and Oscar Robertson, Jimmy Rail, Rick Mount, Lebanon High School, um, Branch McCracken in 1940 and 53, Hurry and Hoosiers, and of course Bob Knight, the 76, 81, 87 national champion Indiana Hoosiers, Steve Alford, Landon Turner. Um, Wayne Radford, Kent Benson. I mean, the history of Indiana basketball is immense. And I know a lot of times, I I wrote an article the other day, or I I wrote an article that ended up turning into a debate about the 1992 Duke and Indiana game. And Bobby Sheridan of the Sheridan Report, who's a good friend of the show, is a good friend of mine, he made a comment about how he thought that Duke team was the, obviously the better team because I ranked Duke like the, the 92 Duke team, the number three team of all time. And somebody, some Indiana fan goes on there and says, you know, they weren't even the best team in the Final Four that year. And Bobby made the simple comment that, you know, Indiana was lucky they were in that game. And then you get the guy getting mad and talking about the foul situation in the 92 game and all that. And Bobby calls me and he goes, man, I can't believe you Indiana people. This is the thing. In Indiana, especially if you're 50 years old or older, you grew up in a time where the gym was full. And when you played that high school basketball game and that gym was full, The gym may have held more than you actually had in your town. The only thing that mattered was that round ball on a Friday or a Saturday night. Playing a sectional, playing a regional. If you're a kid at a small school, you want to be Bobby Plump. You want to be that kid that hits the last second shot, that beats Ben Davis or beats Marion or beats Muncie Central. That's what you dream of. So, in Indiana, basketball is a lot more than just a game. It's a way of life. It's what people born before 1990 grew up with. It was ingrained with them. It was everything to them. Is that right or wrong? That's for you to judge. But the passion that Indiana Hoosier fans have, the Purdue Boilermaker fans have, the Butler Bulldog fans have, that Indiana high school basketball fans have is second to none anywhere. So, yeah, sometimes we'll get a little mad if, if you make a comment about Indiana basketball. And even if you're right, we're still going to get mad. Because when you attack Bobby Knight, especially to a guy who's probably in his 40s or 50s or older in the state of Indiana, it's almost like you're attacking our grandfather because growing up in Indiana in the 1970s or the 1980s, it was impossible to think that Bob Knight was infallible. Now, we found out later in life that he was, but maybe that makes it better because we're all fallible. Nobody is infallible, no matter how great you are, no matter how great a coach you are, no matter how well you shoot a basketball. So, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up on the Legends of March Madness. Make sure you check out our last show where I get to interview Don Donaher about the 1967 Dayton Flyers who made it all the way to the national championship game against UCLA Bruins. Don was a great coach. He's a great guy. 88 years old, still smart as a tack. Make sure you check that show out. And also, remember to listen. The Ultimate March Madness National Championship game will be Monday on the Grueling Truth Sports Network where the 1976 Indiana Hoosiers will battle the 1992 Duke Blue Devils to win the Ultimate March Madness National Championship. So for now, everybody be safe, stay in your house, 
at least six feet away from your wife so she can't tell you what to do and take out the trash. And if she tells you to take out the trash, just tell her you're supposed to stay in your house. But for now, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.